The chemical composition of fish meat differs from that of warm-blooded animal meat. Fish contain a special type of fatty acid which is polyunsaturated or essential fat. Without getting too far into the nitty-gritty, polyunsaturated fats are called that because they are not saturated with hydrogen atoms. They contain a lower concentration of them than saturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats, like omega-3s, offer a number of health benefits, which is why doctors often recommend fish oil tablets to their patients. Fish look for deeper water, while man's always looking for something better. And that's why I'm in one of the best seafood restaurants to learn how to prepare fish. Hello, Kirill. Thank you so much for welcoming me into your kitchen. I'm so glad to meet you because nothing ever goes quite right when I try to cook fish. It either becomes too dry or I undercook it, and I don't know who to blame, myself, the fish. Well, I'd say most of the blame lies with you for such results. Seafood must be prepared properly in order well, to turn out harsh. well. You also need to make sure you're choosing the right fish. You want to know that what you're buying was caught, transported, frozen, and defrosted properly. If it was frozen, there are a lot of nuances when it comes to seafood, to be honest. It's very important to make sure that the fish you're cooking is as fresh as possible. Most chefs would agree that your first concern would be how fresh the fish is and how much time it took to transport it from the place it was caught to the restaurant, from the supplier to the customer. The second trick is preparing it so that it doesn't get overcooked. Nitrogen-containing organic compounds, called amines, are responsible for the freshness of fruit. They are found in the tissue, and they are the product of protein metabolism. Live fish only have a small amount of them, a low percentage. When stored, the number of amines increases rapidly due to the process of fermentation. On the one hand, they have a beneficial effect on the human digestive system. On the other, they become food for various microorganisms that contribute to rapid decay. The fermentation process is also responsible for the scent that even fresh fish have. Citric, or acidic acids, help suppress this smell. They make the aroma molecules less volatile. The scales of fresh fish will be smooth and shiny, and the body is flexible. It shouldn't have a strong odor either, just a barely perceptible scent. The head is a good indicator to whether the fish is fresh or not. Do you look at its eyes to see if it's fresh, or what exactly? You have to look into its eyes and then okay. look at its gills. The gills should be bright red, and the eyes should be... How would you describe it? Sparkly? Sparkly, yes. You want the fish to have bright, really? shiny, round eyes. Yes, if the eyes are sunken and cloudy, that means the fish is a few days old already. Unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to look into our salmon's eyes. It was brought to the kitchen headless. But according to all other parameters, the fish was extremely fresh. Coming up in the program, what's the difference between farmed and wild salmon, and why do they require different methods of cooking? Plus, what do salmon and flamingos have in common? We have two kinds of salmon here. Okay. So, the first kind is wild salmon, the second one is from a farm. I see. Now, as a layman, I would assume wild salmon is better, more natural, pure. Is that the case? No, unfortunately not always. The thing is, wild fish can sometimes have all sorts of parasites living inside the body. So it has to be frozen first. But farmed salmon don't have this problem because they receive vaccinations. Parasites that can live in wild salmon die when deep frozen. The majority of seafood is frozen in any case for easier transportation. Still, many chefs will say that wild fish has a richer flavor than that of farm fished. One of the most important factors that affect the quality and taste of salmon is its habitat. Because wild fish travel long distances, they have a well-developed muscular system and their flesh contains almost no fat. Farmed salmon are usually grown in small reservoirs, and as a rule, their diet isn't as diverse as a natural one. Uh, 
The color of salmon comes from the presence of astaxanthin, a natural pigment in their diet. It belongs to the same group of natural pigments as beta-carotene, which gives carrots their orange color. Wild salmon feed on small krills, who in turn feed on seaweed, which is rich in astaxanthin. Flamingos feed on the same seaweed, which explains why their feathers get their pink hue. What a colorful food chain. Even if we look inside, we will see that the flesh has a very bright red color, a very concentrated color. That's not red, that's salmon. It's salmon, you're right. Farmed salmon have a lighter color. It's more pink. Mm -hmm. Yes, that one. It's softer. Let's get down to cooking. We'll start with the farm salmon. First, we need to cut off the fins and get rid of the bones using a special tool. The last stage of preparing the fish is to remove the skin. That's a clever trick to remove the skin without damaging the flesh. By the way, interestingly enough, salmon skin is used to make purses, purses, shoes. Really? I was just kidding. Yeah, shoes are made from its skin. Sturgeon are also used. Salmon skin is fairly valuable material. Then don't throw it away, I'll take it. No, I won't toss it out. We are going to smoke the farmed salmon, but first it's necessary to remove the excess moisture and that can be done with the help of everyday table salt. The thing is that the fish absorbs only as much salt as is necessary. Okay. You could even cover it with five pounds of salt if you wanted, but the amount will always depend on the time it sits and how much it can absorb. We use coarse salt, which is crystallized. So it has a large surface area. And as a result, it can soak up a lot more moisture. Salmon can not only be salted, but sugared as well. Sugar has similar absorbent properties and gives the fish an unusual taste. The meat must be left to sit on the salt and sugar mixture overnight. Afterwards, it can be sent to the smoker. There are two methods for smoking fish. Hot smoking temperatures are above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. At such temperatures, the process of denaturation or destruction of proteins begin. The structure of the connective tissues of collagen changes, causing the muscle fibers of meat or fish to become soft. The temperature range for cold smoking is 70 to 90 degrees. Chemical changes in the flesh are caused by fermentation. The meat matures and becomes dehydrated. It takes several days. Smoke is also a great natural preservative. Carbon monoxide, alcohols, aldehydes, acids, and other incomplete combustion products allow for long-term protection of the meat from decay. We decided not to smoke the wild sockeye salmon. Its meat compared to the farm fish is lean. It has almost no fat, so there's really no need to dehydrate it. Plus, given the fact that the filet itself already has a rich taste and no aromatic additives such as smoke are needed, we will simply serve the sockeye salmon lightly salted. So tell me, since we aren't going to smoke this piece, can we just shake off the salt after a while and just place it on a piece of bread? Yeah, it would be just like buying a piece of lightly salted salmon at the store. Alexander, it turns out that the trout that you brought me was from a farm, not wild. I know this because I was able to find the presence of fatty layers here and the color of the meat. I see. So does that mean you didn't like my present then? I mean, of course, it would have been nice of you to grab a fishing rod, set out for the coast and catch me some fresh wild salmon. You know, I thought about it, but then I decided not to deprive bowler bears of their food. They are an endangered species after all. Well, for the sake of an endangered species, I agreed to cook the farm trout. Look at it, it's so fatty, meaning there's less of a chance I'll dry it out. In that case, I'm looking forward to dinner. Coming up in the program, neither fish nor meat, how do you cook shellfish? Why does octopus change color and decrease several times in size when it's cooked? And what can we do to ensure that octopus doesn't become rubbery when preparing it? While the salmon is on the salt tray, acquiring a pleasant taste in the smoker, I'm not going to waste my time when I have a chef at hand who can teach me many different things. For example, how to cook other kinds of seafood. 
There are two main rules to cooking fish that must never be forgotten. The fish must be fresh and never overcooked. And that goes twice for the preparation of other types of seafood because some products require long cooking times, others short, and there are even certain types that should be cooked twice. I take it that we're now going to move on to something special, something out of the ordinary, that is. Yes, we are cooking a sea monster, I'd call it. I would too. That's what it looks like. It's creepy. We usually see it in a different light. A colorful, beautiful creature swimming around, hiding behind rocks. Or as a prepared dish with some garnish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or as fried food. This is how it looks, really. Not very appetizing. Not very beautiful. Not the cutest representative of the this marine is his world. Head? Nutritionists argue that octopus, just like seafood in general, is very healthy. They contain a lot of protein, vitamins, and minerals, and very few calories. And while it may be true that a raw octopus doesn't seem appetizing, a true chef can turn it into a delicacy. It is not an easy animal to catch. You can't use nets to catch them. You have to catch them by hand, so it's pretty hard work. Well, as I understand it, it's not just difficult to catch, it's also not easy to cook correctly so that it doesn't become chewy either. It all comes down to cooking times and proper preparation of the octopus, and so there are a few tricks to be aware of when you're cooking it. The muscles of octopi have five times as much collagen as fish, and the connective tissue of this group of marine animals is very rigid. Using the wrong cooking method, or timing, can lead to even greater hardening of the collagen and the octopus becomes chewy. To soften the connective tissues, it is recommended to massage the octopus beforehand. Freezing and then slowly defrosting it produces the same effect, however. It's also not recommended to simply throw it into the boiling water. You've got to submerge it several times. Interesting. Dip it in. For a few seconds, take it out, dip it in, take it out. Okay. And you do that five to six times. As soon as the tentacles start to roll up a little and acquire a more stable shape, you can drop it in the water and cook it at a very low heat. The water shouldn't be too hot. I mean, it should be boiling, but not out of control. When the octopus is cooked for a long period of time at a low heat, its hard fibers soften and the meat becomes tendered. There's one more trick I can share with you. Many Europeans say that when you're cooking an octopus, you should put two wine corks in the pan with it. All right. Mm -hmm. One or two. For good luck? I don't know why, actually. I'd be interested to know if there is some physical or chemical explanation. We tried it ourselves, but it didn't really make a difference in the end. But maybe there's some secret. Perhaps it does change something, so we, just in case, we put them in there. There is no scientific explanation for this practice, but there is a curious fact that may shed some light on where this tradition came from. In the south of Italy, octopus was a sort of fast food. They were sold along the roads and were cooked in large tanks in which the animals were difficult to find. Therefore, sellers began to tie a cork to each octopus with a string. When it surfaced, it showed the exact location of the animal. An hour has passed, and we can now take our octopus out of the pot. It has really changed in appearance. Wow, look how small it is. It got smaller, yes, boiled down. It's three times as small. Its tentacles have curled up as if they were permanently curled, just like my hair, and it got darker. How did it all happen? What process occurred in the pot? Why did you make it smaller? Well, we didn't make it smaller on purpose. It is just a natural process for any ingredient that contains a lot of proteins. The proteins denaturate and become much smaller. The color of the octopus changed because of its chromatophore cells, which are present just below the surface of its skin. They contain pigment particles or different colors that are found in special compartments in the cell. The pigments can increase or decrease, changing the skin color of the octopus. When cooked, the octopus turns brown. Well, it looks wonderful, just fabulous. Yeah, nature has created some truly remarkable things, things that are really beautiful. You can actually find the golden ratio here. It's present, there, take a look. I see now. I didn't find it beautiful when it was raw, however. Uncooked, it was quite terrifying, but now it's been cooked. 
and we can use it in all sorts of other dishes. We can fry it and add it to pieces in salad. So we can actually eat it now? Yes. Coming up in the program, what does molecology refer to? Can I hear the sound of the ocean in a shell? And how to cook a sea snail that has a very interesting name, a well. It's time to get to know another sea creature a bit better, this time a whelk. These are sea snails that have a conical shell that was used in the past as a musical instrument. Whelks and octopi belong to the same phylum, mollusca, although one would be hard-pressed to find similarities in their appearance. The time has finally come for my Malacology for Beginners lecture. This is a branch of science that deals with mollusks, Indeed, there is much to explore when it comes to these invertebrates. There are about 150,000 species of mollusks in the world. They range from a giant octopus, which was found in New Zealand in the 16th century, to the smallest gastropods, Amenocera rota, which live in a shell. By the way, there is a branch of science that studies these invertebrates specifically. It's called conchology. But it certainly does not cover why one can hear the sound of the ocean in a shell. The truth is, it's just the noise of the environment and the current of blood in the human body that you're hearing. Any container will simply enhance these sounds. The same can be heard if you hold a glass to your ear, for example. I see the surprises never end here. What are these little sea bugs? These are basically snails. Take a look, you can see clearly now. That's a little tentacle that usually sticks out. Okay. This is the tentacle that it uses to explore things. The mollusk is quite unusual in terms of cooking. It must be cooked twice. That is, it cannot be just fried or boiled immediately when raw or it will turn out very hard and chewy. That's why we used a method of slow cooking. Whelks and octopi have many connective proteins, elastin and collagen, in their muscle fibers. When heated, they contract and the meat of the mollusk hardens. But if the mollusk is quickly dipped in hot water, they will not have time to warm up and become rigid. Our chef doesn't recommend boiling whelks at all, but simply letting them, quote, bathe in the water. When whelks are defrosted, put them in a pot of water and turn on the stove on low. Stir the water and whelks Stir with your hand. Stir hot water by hand? The water is cold at first. Ah, okay. Then as soon as the water starts to warm up and you can feel that the water is hot, you drain the water and the whelks are ready for the next step in the process. So you've stirred them with your hand and they've been warmed up. You can go ahead and eat them now. They're tasty. But ideally, they should be fried first. I can wait. No problem. I'll wait until they're fully ready. The whelks should be fried afterwards so that the Maillard reaction, or browning, can take place, and it is this reaction that gives the meat its pleasant taste and aroma. This chemical process begins at a temperature of 140 degrees. At the molecular level, the Maillard reaction is the reaction between simple sugars and proteins. Therefore, it's necessary to add carbohydrates when cooking these, rich in proteins. Here we use white wine. Perfect. We also add tomatoes, basil, salt, pepper, and butter. Why butter? I know that scallops are also cooked with butter. Why can't we fry it with vegetable oil? We can. We use olive oil as well for frying sometimes. But butter gives the sauce a more appropriate consistency. Mm -hmm. So it makes a better sauce, and butter also enriches the taste of seafood. We add butter when we cook squids, scallops, and clams. Butter is always a good addition. So our whelks will be fat and a little tipsy. Fat and a bit tipsy, yes. They'll okay, be a bit sour cook. and seasoned with basil. We will cook the whelks in a frying pan together with the other ingredients for a short period of time, just until they turn a rather appetizing golden color. I can't wait to give them a try. I've never had a chance to sample such a dish before. Thank you very much. It looks like chicken, but the price tells me there's something much more special than that. Pearls, perhaps. These are just well. Now we're going to give them a try. They smell amazing. 
I can't send the smell to you, unfortunately, but it's unbelievable. Do they remind you of anything? Well, you promised that it would be a bit like squid. And scallops. Yeah, and scallops. But in my opinion, it's different. There's a little bit more elasticity I see. than squid or scallop, and they taste better, in my opinion. I really Maybe like them. Maybe they taste like octopus? Mm -hmm. The consistency is similar. Yes. The, they taste like octopus, but softer. While I was being taught the art of cooking sea snails, both the farm raised and the wild salmon had time to sit and are now ready to be eaten, which means it's time to serve everything up. You can really see the difference in color. And I can feel the vast difference in taste. It's almost as if these weren't both salmon. Yes, they taste a lot different. I mean, they taste and look different. They are two different fish. Chef, let's be clear though. If we hadn't used such high quality fish, this wouldn't taste so delicious. I mean, the fish that you can find packaged in the store, be it smoked or otherwise, are of a completely different sort. This is another level. Well, of course. If it really was that simple, people would have no reason to go to restaurants. That's our job, to make everything correctly so it comes out perfect, to prepare something you cannot get in the store. That's why I can't reveal all of our secrets to you. I love to give useful gifts. And look at what you've done with what I gave you. You know, I have a feeling this gift was more for you than me. Not in the least. After all, without my present, you wouldn't have learned how to prepare this exquisite dish. Oh yes, and now I'll remember for the rest of my life how fish proteins are broken down, what causes certain pigments in certain fishes, and the process of fermentation that takes place when smoking a fish. And thank you for dinner. Shall we dig in? Help yourself. Great, thank you. If nothing else, it looks to have turned out nice. More than nice. Well? Delicious. But I think something is missing. A glass of French wine would be perfect for the occasion. After all, fish and wine are an ideal and harmonious combination. Sauvignon Blanc, for example, would be ideal. Actually, you're having white wine already. I added it to the fish when I was cooking it. It's time you trained your taste buds to notice such things. You're right. I'll start first thing tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> 